It's Badminton World, the show that brings you all things badminton from the four corners of the globe. In the next 30 minutes, we focus on the quest for life after badminton, with a man credited with the emergence of a new breed of champions. And we profile a musically inclined shuttler equally adept with the racket and the guitar. And of course, the latest world rankings and results from one of the most lucrative events in the world of badminton. challenges for a badminton champion upon calling it a day is recalibrating his or her position in society mentally and physically. Most would go for the natural option by turning to coaching. This will enable them to remain in the ecosystem that earned them fame, prestige and in most cases titles. We take a look at two ex-players creating an impact in the coaching world. Pulela Gopichan is an Indian legend the biggest name to emerge from India since Prakash Padukon. In negotiating life after playing, Gopichan is driven by a new philosophy. As a player, he was only interested in his game. As a coach, in contrast, he has to look at the bigger picture. As a player, it was uh, really, I was one of the players who would really stay to myself and really focus on my game. And whatever else was happening around was really not my botheration. So it would be very simple in the sense um, for rest, for food, for practice. Everything depended on whether it would improve my game. So it was like a single pointed thing. Well, on, as on today's state, I think things are different because uh, when you have uh, so many young players playing under you, you have to take care of many aspects of their. Gopichan, who also runs an academy in Hyderabad, realizes his decisions could make or break a career. So as a coach, he has embraced the true spirit of sharing. I think and you have to also change your thinking with the times and you have to always be alert. Um, yes, I am uh, one who is bold in whether it's been my playing career or my coaching career. It's always been decisions which I've taken which have been um, which have benefited in a lot of ways, but have been bold decisions which I've taken. And uh, as today, I would say some of the decisions are um, uh, are taken with a lot more care, so that um, it's it's the case of many many youngsters. And I want to ensure that whatever knowledge I have and whatever experience I have, I'm really careful with with that when I make decisions regarding my students. Gopichan opted for coaching after a chat with a friend who offered words of wisdom. Take up a career in the media or become an administrator without having to carry the country's weight of expectation. Or take up the challenge of shaping the future of Indian badminton, come what may. There are going to be a lot of people who will say a lot of things. But uh, you'll have to decide whether you want to do it in spite of them. And I'm happy and glad that I've chose that, uh, uh, this path. Thanks to his years as a player, Gopichan possesses the technical know-how in running his academy in Hyderabad. So all of those experiences basically trying to ensure that uh, the players learn from the mistakes which I have done and also the players benefit from the things which I have done. So basically transferring what I have experienced in my life uh, into the players. Beneficiaries of Gopichan's training methods remain indebted to the former All England champion. You know, I can say whatever I've reached, whatever level I've reached in badminton is, I can give all the credit to him. He's worked very hard on me and uh, whatever success India is, uh, you know, uh, showing right now, whatever uh, talent India is showing right now, uh, so many number of players are doing really well, all the credit goes to Gopi. He's worked really hard on everyone. Uh, uh, he's put India in the world stage and the world map in uh, badminton. And it has been a wonderful experience for me as a player because you get to learn a lot from him because he keeps himself in our position. Like whatever situations we are going through, he's been through those situations before as well. So he is a very good. He guides us in the right direction, basically. I've been a student of him, and uh, till here I've come because of him. And I'm into top 20. I mean now I'm world rank 17, 
and I'm very thankful to him because, um, because of him I'm here. Does Gopichan wheel the big stick? He's a, he's a strict coach. He's a strict coach. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're wrong, he, he, he's going to scold us. And he, he encourages us as well, you know. He... But for all his court craft and finesse on the badminton court, Gopi Chand, an economics graduate, could have earned his livelihood elsewhere. I think the options weren't many, really, because um, it was either I play sport and I, or I would have been a software engineer, engineer like so many other Indian people are. His coaching credentials have been enhanced thanks to Sina's Olympic medal in 2012. Uh, we looked far from doing it years ago. If I were to tell this about uh, five years ago, they would say it was a joke. And uh, today, um, yeah, we, we're looking positive. So the medal at the Olympics was important for, um, from a country's point. How does he regard his All England title in 2001? The most important thing. Yes, their medals at the Commonwealth Games as a team championship, those are very important as well. But uh, if I were to look at my career, um, I think that 2001 All England would stand out. Badminton. No sport comes close. Nama saya Golwin dari Malaysia. Saya nak tunjuk apa yang ada dalam bag saya. Ada ada sotong. <laughs> tak ada lagi chain saja lah. Ini dua botol air saja. Air selalu ada. Dengan ini tape untuk kaki saya. Eh ini snack snack. Biskut saja, biskut dengan skipping rope dengan teraban untuk training dan ini saya ada empat batang raket so far sebab dah dah crack saya belum ambil lagi. Lima enam um, dengan grip yang saya untuk balut raket. Coming up next, we turn back the clock to May 1992 for the historic Thomas Cup win for Malaysia. Hi, I am Pulela Gopichan, and you're watching Badminton World. Turn euphoric at 12:36 a.m. on May 17, 1992, as the Thomas Cup returned to Kuala Lumpur after a 25-year wait following Rexy Manaiki's poor return that hit the net from Subin Kiang's smash in the second doubles. That match-winning point could see of Ben Kiang and his partner Chesun Kit, a veteran of three previous Thomas Cup final rounds, came about after one of the most heart-stopping matches in Thomas Cup history. The battle swung back and forth until way past midnight when Ben Kiang delivered the victory point. Players and officials stormed onto the court and cried uncontrollably as Malaysia laid their hands on the silver cup for only the fifth time. A jubilant Sun Kit, only 24 then, was hoisted shoulder high by an exultant crowd, a moment that he will cherish forever. It was very unbelievable. We did it, finally did it, after, I think after six years. So. Oh, it, it just can we cannot don't know. Oh, the segment is too great. No, oh, it only boils down to us when, after all the celebration, then we finally managed oh, to take a bar, settle down. Oh, then we come to my. Oh, we really, really, really won, won the cup. Oh, so it's once is a very unforgettable experience for me. Four years of hard work in executing the Thomas Cup, Uber Cup, Olympic Games, TUO project bore fruition. A vision that was laid down by BAM President Tan Sri Elias Omar, the idea of employing Chinese coaches to monitor a long-term program worked wonders. I thought they were good coaches, you know. They were street disciplinarian too, and they, had got, they were good technicians. 
into a good place, we took coaches who were good players themselves, like Han Jiang, Yang Yang. You know, I brought Yang Yang to, to not so much to coach Rashid, but to spar with him. And it paid off when Rashid set the tone in the final, beating Ardi Wiranata in the first singles over three games. But his elder brothers, Razif and Jalani, went down to their Indonesian foes, Eddie Hartono and Gunawan. Fukok Kyung tipped the scales again when he beat Alan Budikasuma in straight set. He had never beaten Alan before this. Stadium Nagara reverberated. The capacity crowd knew the second doubles would decide the final since Kwan Yok Meng was not expected to beat Joko Suprianto in the third singles. Then came Sun Kit and Ben Kiang. That historic night created a huge impression on everybody, from the younger set of players to the young boy in the streets. That's, that's the thing that just sparkled me truly to, to start to play badminton and seeing the legends, you know, playing, you know, the smashing, you know, all these uh, you know, powerful skills they have, you know. So, you know, makes you know, sparkle my uh, interest actually to play badminton. In 92, I was uh, 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 backup players, but I find the environment during that time is uh, so, so, uh, so different, you know, compared to right, right now, you know. Even the players, all, they are so, hungry for, you know, to, to win. So I find it is, uh, hopefully one day we can, uh, know, we can uh, be like that again. We are so proud, you know, we are, even, even I, I watch them play, I feel like, okay, one day I want to be like them also. So, so the, the, the kind of thing is motivate us. The biggest lesson of all was that the glorious 1992 victory signaled endless possibilities for a team backed by the public. Badminton is where Malaysia is termed as a world-class nation and supported by a badminton-loving population of 28 million. The possibilities of the present generation to emulate the class of 1992 is definitely endless. Badminton. No sport comes close. One of Polela Gopichan's contemporary as a player was Denmark's Kenneth Jonasson. Like Gopichan, Jonasson has made the smooth transition into the world of coaching, bringing with him the strong work ethics he was known for throughout his career. The two-time Olympian and former European champion spent three years coaching the English team before being lured back to Denmark recently. But he is keen to continue developing as a coach. Coming off as a player, you think you know a lot, but you don't. Uh, it's so different because you have to uh, deal with different personalities, uh, uh, how people deal with issues, deal with problems, uh, the mental side of uh, partnerships. And it's just been a great learning experience and I'm, I'm, I'm still at the very beginning stage of it. I feel there's so, so much more to learn. The 39-year-old is driven by his desire to help his charges maximise their potential. I think I'm, I'm trying to bring that you need to keep developing as a player. Uh, it, it's not enough to be good at one thing, you need to be a very rounded player. Uh, so it's the inspiration that even though you're good, you still want to improve because you want to make sure that you're also one of the best in the future. And so it's never too, too late to learn, you've got to keep pushing on. Jonathan is intent on developing his own coaching style while empowering his charges to learn to chart their own course. But I also find it's very important that you find your own style, what works for you, for my personality. And uh, I try to individualise my coaching a lot to each player, to understand their personalities and so not just do the same with everybody. Uh, and then just, I'm a very demanding coach. Uh, but I, in terms of I want my players to run the, run the programme, not me to run it all the time. A player who has benefited from Jonathan's coaching is England's Rajiv Yusuf. Uh, yeah, obviously he was a very good ex-player. Um, so when I found out he was coming to England, I was very excited. Um, and I thought I could learn a lot from him. And uh, yeah, he's, he's come in and, and I think my game has improved a lot since he's come here. Um, I did very well in, in some big tournaments. So, um, I mean, the first week he came, I think I won the US Open. So you can see the improvements kind of straight away. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's good for me because he can also still practice to a high level uh, with me in England. So yeah, I get, I get the good uh, coaching off court and also on court as well. Jonathan can be quite a strict taskmaster too. Yeah, he can be. I think he wants you to work as hard um, as, as you can and push you to your limits. So I think being an ex-player himself, he knows 
that you can always be pushed a little bit further. So I think, yeah, he is quite hard, but I think he's, you also need to be pushed hard as well. Now that Jonathan is back in his native Denmark, we can expect the Danes to enjoy the fruits of his labour. Badminton. No sport comes close. Coming up on Badminton World, the Asiata Cup, the victors and the vanquished. Hi, my name is Kenneth Jonasen. You're watching Badminton World. Welcome back to Badminton World. After almost two weeks of intense and exciting badminton action, Malaysia bagged the Asiata Cup 2013, inspired by the presence of world number one Lee Chong Wei in the final, as the hosts defeated Thailand 3-1 to pocket the 400,000 US dollar prize money. In what was his first match as a first-time father, 30-year-old Chong Wei crushed Tanong Sak Sensumbun Sok 21-12, 21-18 before his home crowd. And the crucial first point inspired his teammates, mixed doubles Chan Peng Soon, Goh Liu Ying, and men's doubles Ku Kian Kiat, Tan Bun Hyung to deliver the points at the Kuala Lumpur Badminton Stadium. The Asia All Star beat Indonesia 3 1 for third place. The Asiata Cup, badminton's richest team championship event, which offers a total of 1 million US dollars in prize money, kicked off with a preliminary stage in Surabaya and Kuala Lumpur. Indonesia topped the preliminaries in Surabaya beating Vietnam and Singapore, both with similar 4-0 margins before they were held to a 2-2 draw by Malaysia and the Asia All-Stars. Eventual champions Malaysia impressed in the 4-0 win over the Philippines, but found Indonesia and the Thais tough nuts to crack as they drew 2-2 before making short work of Europe in Surabaya. Preliminary round two saw Malaysia beating Asia All-Stars 3-1, while Thailand sent Europe packing to earn a ticket to the semis along with Indonesia. In the last four, Malaysia again were pitted against Asia All-Stars, and a repeat performance earned them a 3-0 victory and a place in the final. Indonesia meanwhile succumbed to the thighs, as Rachana Intanon was in her element as she defeated Linda Weni Fenetri and led her team to a win. Edmonton. No sport comes close. Now let's take a peek at the world rankings so far. Despite the shock defeat for Li Chong Wei in the Australian Open GP goal to China's Tian Hao Wei, the Malaysian ace remains firmly on top of the men's singles with Hong Kong's Hu Yun, the only newcomer in the top five. As Chen Long, Du Peng Yu and Indonesia's Sonny Dui Kunchoro at number two, three and four respectively. The top five in the women's singles again remain unchanged, with Li Zuri of China on top. The men's doubles section is still dominated by Danish pair Matthias Bo and Karsten Mogensen. In the women's doubles, the top five remains the same, with Wang Xiaoli and Yu Yang holding on to number one. The same goes in the mixed doubles, with China's Zhu Chen and Ma Jin firmly at the top. For more information, you can visit the BWF official website. It's now time to profile one of the darlings of Indonesia. She fell in love with the game at the age of five, got herself enrolled into one of the best badminton schools before getting her big break at the age of 14. Today, Gracia Poli is a member of the BWF Athletes Commission. Born in Jakarta on August 11, 1987, Gracia, the third child among five siblings, lived in Indonesia's bustling capital until the family had to uproot themselves to Manado following the sad demise of her father, Willy, when she was only two. A year after picking up the racket at the age of five, she became a champion in a small tournament. I started to play badminton since I was five years old. And then I just loved doing it. And also because of my parents and my siblings are or playing a badminton player, some of them. So I just, I just like, you know, like as a children, you know, you just, I just play, and then finally I became loving it, love to play, love to play badminton. 
Noticing her daughter's potential to go far, Gracia's mother, Evie Pakasi, knew there was only one place to turn her daughter's dreams into a reality. Jakarta was the hub of many things. Only there, Gracia could be given the opportunity to blossom. When I was eight years old, my mom was ask, uh, asking about what do you want to do with your life? And by the time that do you want to do you want to continue your I mean do you want to to go to your school I mean in the education or do you want to play sport like badminton so I just I just, I just say okay I want to I want to I want to play badminton for my life by the time she was 8 Gracie was enrolled into one of Jakarta's best known academies Jaya Raya which proudly count Olympic champions Alan Budikasuma Susi Susanti and Chandra Vijaya among their products Susi, who won gold in the Barcelona Olympics, remains Gracia's source of inspiration. Uh, I like Susi Sandy. <laughs> when I know her in person, I become like her because in the personal, her personal life is very disciplined and he, he, he shares about her life when, when, when how to become a champion, how to become, uh, you know, how to become a, g a great person. Yeah, so I, I, l I love her. So how does Gracie describe herself outside the court? I am a, a, an easygoing person. <laughs> and I love, I love people. I love people. So I, uh, yeah, you can say, yeah, maybe they can say I'm a people person. So, so I just like to hang out with them and you know, like to help others, to love others. Badminton has enabled her to travel the world. And one of her favorite destinations? It would be Switzerland. <laughs> because, I don't know, I, I just love it. I just love Switzerland because I know I found peace there when you know, not, not so crowded as, you know, like, the, like Jakarta, you know, like a uh, big city. Indonesia, though, is where her heart is when it comes to plying her trade. Because I love the crowd. I love, I love how Indonesian, like, cheering us. I love, I, I think, like, um, you can ask the other players, they, 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 will, they would love Indonesia when they play in Indonesia because, you know, the, the crowd are, are different. The supporters, the, you know, it's totally different when, when you play in Indonesia. Despite her busy schedule, Gracia loves to touch base with her fans thanks to the advent of the social media. Yeah, thank God for Twitter. Finally, because, you know, for, because of Twitter, I mean, for the social media, we, me and my fans, I can, you know, like, um, connect each other. Connect each other and I just, yeah, of course, I don't have time to, like, to manage to, 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 to replay one by one, but I just, I read what, what they're, they're saying, I read what, uh, what they, they want to talk with me. Yeah, I appreciate all, all the followers, I appreciate all the fans who love me and who stand with me until this far. In coming to grips with the game on an international platform, Gracia has a hobby to take her mind away from the daily grind. If she's not holding a racket, Gracia is likely to be found strumming the guitar. Her passion for music equals her passion for badminton. Outside, I like to, I like to listen to music. I like to play music in some inter, instrument. I like to chilling, to chill with my friends. I like to read book. I like to dive. So, just how good is Gracia with the guitar? Well, you're about to find out. Here she is with an exclusive unplugged performance just for Badminton World. This is what I do outside aside of badminton and this is all I I will sing even though I'm not good at singing but I will sing for you for my fans especially for my fans okay here we go mm -hmm. 